I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He's the closest thing to a living cartoon that we'll ever see. He's made millions making goofy faces, while also turning in quite a few powerful dramatic performances, alongside a legendary stand-up career. At one time, this rubber-faced goofball was the biggest movie star in the world. But as the years pass, his weekend box office draw has weakened, and the flop started to come more frequently. And this comedian has been surrounded by a handful of controversies that rival the plots of some of his most outrageous films. He's an incredibly spiritual person. Lots of meditating, praying, preaching, painting. He's still around, but it's different. Let's find out what the f happened to Jim Carrey. WTF! Lots of funny people come from Canada, and Jim Carrey is one of them. As a kid, Jim had lots of things. Lots of love, lots of smiles, lots of laughter, but not lots of money. They were so poor, and for a time, his family lived in a van. Jim would use his superpower sense of humor to bring bits of joy to his family during these hard times. He was a driven young lad who idolized comedians like Andy Kaufman and Rodney Dangerfield. Little Jimmy always had his sights on becoming a professional entertainer. Many brush Jim off as just a stupid guy who does stupid things, while others see him as the next evolutionary step in the art of slapstick. My wife hates him, but she loves The Truman Show, and there's lots of people out there like that. Jim Carrey has at least one movie for every type of movie watcher. But I'm getting a little Jim carried away. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. It all started on the stand-up stage. Just a young man, a microphone, some jokes, and a face. A one-of-a-kind face that could transform into any other face. Jim would spend hours staring at himself in the mirror until he perfected his celebrity impressions. And even though his family was struggling financially, his father always supported Jim's dream of being in the comedy spotlight. Jim would do anything on stage to get a laugh. His wild comedic antics and his impressions impressed legendary comedian Rodney Dangerfield. So much that he took Jim on tour with him. He was traveling the country, opening for Dangerfield, and this allowed Jim to get his wacky face out there people were starting to notice. This led to him becoming a regular at the Comedy Store, where he pretty much killed it every night. People who witnessed early Jim's stand-up said it was always a gut-bustin' knee slapping good time. And this led to television work. He starred in the sitcom The Duck Factory, where he played an animator. But the series was soon canceled. It was a rude awakening for Jim. This Hollywood success thing wasn't going to be easy. Plus, his character in The Duck Factory was very limited. For some reason, they cast him as the straight man. Many who knew what Jim was capable of described the show as an insane waste of talent. And talent is a terrible thing to waste. Producers still didn't know what to do with Jim. Everyone could see the talent, but they didn't know how to translate it to TV or film. Yet. <laughs> After the show was canceled, Jim soon found himself broke. Again. While taking care of his father and his sick mother, who had expensive medical needs, Jim Carrey became depressed. He didn't know what to do, and he considered quitting show business. And right as he was about to give up forever, he got the call to co-star in a vampire comedy. The film was once bitten. It's about a vampire looking for a virgin, and Jim played that virgin. It was good. A nice little film to get him started. Nothing groundbreaking, though. But good. At that time, he was still focusing on his stand-up career, and even though his goofy celebrity impressions were getting standing ovations every night, he was bored with that material. It was time for this comedian to reinvent his entire act. Carey's comedy mentor, loud and legendary Sam Kinison, advised him to drop the clean act and get more raunchy on stage. Jim was no longer doing his beloved rubber-faced family-friendly silly stuff. He was participating in some R-rated anarchy up on stage. He was still the same wild and crazy guy, but this wild and crazy guy had evolved or devolved into an animal. A comedy animal. W whatever it was, it wasn't human. And now, I'd like to eat my own neck! <laughs> His style transformed into an improvisational stream of consciousness therapy session. His stand-up routine became almost experimental shock rock. And of course, it was hilarious. He got small parts in films from great directors like Francis Ford Coppola and Peggy Sue Got Married and Clint Eastwood in The Deadpool. Not that Deadpool, but THE Deadpool. 
Jim Carrey's comedy had always been a little bit out of this world, so it was fitting for him to play an alien space creature thing in the film Earth Girls Are Easy. Seems to be painting all Earth Girls with a with a very broad brush. Painting all them broads very broad. It took two hours to put on the makeup. This was the beginning of a long love-hate relationship between Jim and movie makeup. The film is silly and Jim does what he can with it. Most importantly, it gave him the opportunity to connect with the Waynes brothers, which led to In Living Color. Jim really got to shine as the token Caucasian in this groundbreaking sketch comedy show. So many wild, memorable characters. Anybody and everybody who saw Jim in a skit could tell that this guy had tapped into another level of comedy that nobody had ever done before. Jim worked 16-hour days on In Living Color, working round the clock to make us laugh. But there wasn't much time to enjoy his early success. He was dealing with the devastating loss of his mother and his friend-slash-mentor, Sam Kinison. Plus, his marriage at the time was falling apart. This would be the first of many marriages to fall apart. But that's normal in Hollywood. Jim was happy to see his dream come true, but there was a sadness growing in his heart. And comedy was his medicine. Years went by with no movie offers. Once again, Jim wasn't sure where his career was going. Then the script for Ace Ventura landed right in his lap. Many huge movie stars had turned down the role, but Jim saw this as an opportunity to show off his wild and wacky skills. He agreed to do the film only if he was allowed to rewrite it. And even though he had never written a movie before, they agreed. <laughs> Carey added his wacky flavor to the screenplay and the result was a wild success. He showed the world that his comedic forces were meant for larger screens than just 1990s television sets. The silver screen was a perfect place for Jim Carrey. For a newcomer, Jim had an incredible amount of freedom on set. He was allowed to be creative however he pleased, and he would often improvise, while the rest of the cast and crew struggled to keep in their LOLs. The studio had absolutely no faith in the film, and many of his comedy peers didn't really get it at early screenings. Was this the end of Jim Carrey, they thought? Was it over before it even began, they thought? But oh how wrong they were. The film was a surprise hit and opened at number one. A superstar was born. Alrighty then. Then came The Mask, which is probably my first exposure to the comedy of Carrey. Back in the radical, grungy 90s, my little sister won a door prize at some event we were at, and there was an entire table full of stuffed animals and other girly goodies that she could pick from to claim as her door prize. But no, this four-year-old little girl did not pick the fuzzy teddy bear. She picked a PG-13 VHS tape with a silly green man on it. We went home with our newly adopted VHS and placed it gently into its proper place in the VCR where it stayed for weeks because we watched that cinematic masterpiece on loop until the tape was smoking, And then we smoked the tape. No, I'm just kidding. But if that was the only way to get our mask fix, then we, we would have smoked the f out of that sh But that's not how you watch movies, kids. Don't smoke movies. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by JoeBlow.com. Let's rock this joint! The mask was the first sign of how divisive Jim's style could be. His performance in The Mask was nominated for a Golden Globe and a Razzie, the second best prestigious award, and the number one worst award at the same time. That describes Jim perfectly. He's the best and the worst. But seriously, this film is something else. It's wild and crazy, but it has heart, and the makeup took four hours to slap on Jim's face. Jim could finally be a real-life cartoon. It seems like this character was made for Jim Carrey. It truly allowed him to release his cartoon demon that was possessing his soul. Oh, and that's something that people actually believe. You know, Jim is part of the Illuminati, of course, and he's even joked about it. Joked, I put joked in quotes. And some well-respected conspiracy theory scholars say that Jim is actually possessed by demonic forces that brainwash us with funniness so that the evil overlords can control us. I believe it. It's the only explanation for why he's so gosh darn ha ha hilarious. I like it. <laughs> it is a straight It's the symbol of the all mocking tongue. <laughs> and I'm sick of it. I want everybody to be in on the joke, man. You know what I mean? For years now, 
talk show hosts, people on television, people in sitcoms have been hired by the government to <laughs> throw you off the track, to distract you, to make you laugh and stuff like that, make you happy and docile so you don't know what's really going on, you know? And they get out there in the woods in a circle naked and they decide these things and, you know, <clears throat> and you know, look at them, look at them trying to, <laughs> look at them trying to come it up. It's hilarious. You guys remember 1994? Yeah. That 1994, well, that was the golden era of Jim. Back to back to back hits. 1994 was his best year ever. Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber all came out within that 12 month span. And some really smart people say that Dumb and Dumber is a great film. And I am one of those smart people. It is a great film. Jim and Jeff are geniuses at playing dumb. Of course the studio wanted Jim, but they weren't so sure about Jeff Daniels. But Jim had a vision, and he knew that Daniels was perfect. He fought hard to cast him, and history was made. People were starting to take notice of how dedicated Jim was to his craft. And playing Mr. Dumber was no different. He removed an old tooth cap. Yeah, that chipped tooth, it's real. And he was paid $7 million to be dumb. Jim had come a long way from living in that van. Now he's riding in a dog van with $7 million in his pocket. Also, around the same time that Jim was having his best year ever, his father passed away. The man who had helped him build his comedy career was gone. So on the screen, he may have appeared to be a happy clown, but behind the scenes, the clown was very sad. But he couldn't let that slow him down. He kept working and working. <laughs> Joy <get him! laughs> Jim was on top of his game and he was hungry for more. So what do you do when your career is hot and you want it to be hotter? Well, you join a superhero movie franchise. And at that time, the only one that really existed was Batman. So he played the Riddler and Batman Forever. And even though Val Kilmer and Tommy Lee Jones despised working with Jim, the film was a big hit because it's Batman. Riddle me that. Then nature called for him to make a sequel to Ace Ventura. And this time, half the budget went to Jim's paycheck because he was a big movie star now. They had a bigger budget, and the gags were bigger. Ace went to Africa, and he did weird stuff with a rhino. But the bigger budget doesn't always mean the better movie. I like this film, but Jim hates it. And it caused him to stay away from sequels for the rest of his career. Mostly. His next paycheck was $20 million. That's right, $20 million on The Cable Guy. It was the biggest deal for a comedic actor ever. But the movie was not a big hit though, although it's considered a cult classic now. Are you part of that cult? You should join that cult. It's a great cult. Join the Cable Guy cult. Everybody's doing it. Join. Join us. Join us. But yeah, at first people didn't really like the direction Jim took with the Cable Guy. The film was much darker than advertised, and it was a little shocking to see at the time. But now this is considered one of Jim's best. <laughs> <laughs> then he got another $20 million paycheck for Liar Liar. And that's the truth. I love these kind of Jim Carrey movies. It's the perfect balance of PG-13 90s goofiness mixed with some family-friendly fun that pulls at your heartstrings. I love it. <laughs> then came The Truman Show, which was the perfect stepping stone from goofball to respected dramatic thespian because this film gave him the opportunity to do both, and sometimes at the same time. The story attracted Jim so much that he took a huge pay cut. The poor baby was only paid 12 million for this one. Jim always wanted to do serious drama, but he knew he couldn't just jump right into that genre. He had to ease his way in to make films like that. And in The Truman Show, he gets to show off his lovable silliness. But then the story turns, and the silly man is placed in a less silly situation. And Carrie took the role very serious. He even banned the cast and crew from talking about his past silly movies. And Jim was totally snubbed at the Oscars for this one, and he was very vocal about it. But he did win a Golden Globe, which is almost as good as an Oscar. Almost. Carrie proved to the world that he could handle dramatic material. He took on the role for many reasons. One, he could relate to the character, because he was always being followed around by cameras. You know, that gosh darn paparazzi's always snapping Jim in the face. Plus, the story was fantastic. And it makes everybody think, is my life a TV show? 
Am I being watched right now? And yes, yes, the answer is yes, you are. Your life is a TV show, and the episode of you watching this video is great. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> then the Andy Kaufman biopic Man on the Moon soon followed. Legendary director Milos Forman did not want this silly comedy actor in his big cinematic artsy-fartsy movie. So Jim had to audition, which was pretty much unheard of for an actor of his caliber. An audition video was made of Jim banging on Kaufman's actual bongos. Andy's blood literally stained the drums. His DNA was part of the video audition. And Jim used his comedy acting demons to summon Kaufman's comedy acting demons. And that's how movies are made. Jim proved himself to Milos and he was cast in the movie. And Jim showed the world that Andy Kaufman is his spirit animal. Here I come to save the day. He infamously took his method acting too far and made everyone pretty much hate his guts. But the performance was great, so it was totally worth it. Right? He stayed in character the whole time as Andy and Tony Clifton. Some of the behind the scene antics actually led to physical fights, like punching. In the behind the scenes making of DVD bonus features footage was so damning that the studio locked it up because they were afraid it would make Jim look like an a-hole. And it did. The footage was later released and put together in a documentary called Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond. And yeah, Jim takes it too far, but that's what makes Jim, Jim. <laughs> Shut up! Shut up! He was supposed to come to Jim! And I'm not exactly sure if this film helped or hurt him, because word got out that Jim was incredibly difficult to work with, but word also got out that his performance was amazing. And it was. Andy Kaufman's own family praised the film, and Jim pushed the boundaries between fiction, reality, life, and death when he met with Andy's family, while in character as Andy. He was literally born to play this role because Jim and Andy actually share a birthday. Still, no Oscar nom, but he won that Golden Globe. So yeah. Jim went a little too deep into character for Man on the Moon, so much to the point where he questioned his own identity. Thank you very much. So next he did a comedy about split personality. The film was called Me, Myself, and Irene. It was a return to the raunchy Farley Brothers fun. The Green Book guys. <laughs> then came The Grinch. Another film that required him to cover his funny face with green. And Jim Carrey basically became a zen master while going through four hours of Grinch makeup. It was hell. It was so bad that an agent from the CIA was brought in to teach him torture resistance techniques. He tried drama again with the Majestic. It was forgettable, but it was a worthy effort. Another blockbuster was added to Jim's filmography with Bruce Almighty. We played God. He gets God powers and does funny stuff with his God powers. Just like God. My favorite comedian. Like many funny people, Jim suffers from depression and Hollywood harvested that depression to make a great movie. <laughs> Yay, depression. It was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Great title, one of the best titles ever. It was a Michel Gondry, tear-jerking, trippy rom-com adventure that was penned by Charlie Kaufman. Not Andy, Charlie Kaufman. And Charlie's script won a well-deserved Oscar, and his co-star Kate was nominated for an Oscar, and Jim, once again, was not. Kate Winslet is the wild goofball, and Jim is the calm, serious, dramatic one. It's a fabulous ride of a movie that breaks your heart and shows off Jim's subtle side. The film shows that Jim doesn't have to be jumping around talking out of his butt to soar on the silver screen. He just has to... to be. Hi. I'm sorry? I just said hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. And like I said before, Jim really hates putting on character makeup, but... He keeps taking roles that require a ton of character makeup, like in Lemony Smicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. He was so good that he actually frightened the child actors on set. They were legitimately afraid of Jim. And then there was fun with Dick and Jane. He played Dick. Whoa! Yes! Then there was another flop, the incredible Burt Wonderstone, which was not incredible. It was, in fact, an atrocious, unfunny wreck of a movie. But Jim Carrey does seem to be having some fun in it as the intense street magician. 
Jim is actually the only watchable part of this unmagical magic movie. Millions and millions of dollars were lost at the box office. Watch it if you want to, but just, just fast forward to the Jim Carrey moments. Y'all remember that fun superhero movie, Kick-Ass? It's pretty good, right? Well, they made a sequel and it wasn't good. And Jim Carrey was in that film, for a bit. It was basically an extended cameo. But like always, he delivers the goods. People were a little disappointed at Jim's lack of screen time. And there was the controversy. Jim loves controversy. Jim refused to promote the film because of its heavy violence and what Jim saw as a glorification of guns. This was yet another sign that Jim's politics were causing his behavior to become a little unpredictable. I'm sure this hurt his career and forced casting directors to look elsewhere to avoid the Kerry controversy. Maybe not. He even did an anti-NRA, anti-Second Amendment, anti-gun thing song, and that upset many American gun owners. His audience was shrinking every time he opened his mouth. Plus, Jim is often in public Twitter feuds with other famous people, like Shia LaBeouf, Ted Cruz, Sarah Sanders, and the entire cast of Fox and Friends. Jim's private life and relationships have always been in the public eye. Stories of his girlfriends and wives would grace the pages of supermarket tabloids for years. But none was as scandalous as his relationship with a makeup artist named Kat. I don't really like diving deep into celebrities' romantic lives, mostly because I don't care, and because it feels creepy and unnecessary, but I feel like this particular relationship is, is different and important when it comes to understanding what the f*** happened to Jim Carrey. And sometimes these fun WTF videos are sad. Just like fun Jim Carrey movies. Sometimes they have sad bits. And we're about to dive into a real life sad bit. So this young woman who Jim dated also suffered from severe depression. At times things seemed good, but many could see problems looming under the surface. Their first breakup wasn't friendly. Apparently she faked medical documents that said that she didn't have any STDs until she dated Jim Carrey. She accused Jim of infecting her. The two had a very destructive on-again, off-again relationship. And shortly after their final breakup, this poor young woman committed suicide, blaming Jim for why she took her life, claiming that he introduced her to drugs and Hollywood debauchery. And Jim was accused of illegally obtaining the drugs that she used to take her own life. There was a nasty, wrongful death court battle with her family, which consisted of a bunch of he said, she said stuff, and Carrie countersued. Carrie denied all wrongdoings, and vowed to clear his name in the legal system. The whole thing was dismissed in 2018. Hollywood is a vicious beast, and so is depression. And of course, the death of an ex-lover and all the media scrutiny didn't help Jim's mindset, and he sunk deeper into depression. My favorite Jim Carrey quote comes from Jim Carrey himself. Jim Carrey said this about Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey is just an idea. Jim Carrey doesn't really exist. That's deep, brother. I feel ya. I'm woke. I'm woker than woke. I'm, I'm the wokest, and, and so is Jim. But some consider this new mindset of Jim to be a mental breakdown. Or something. I don't know. I think he's onto something. He's experienced the height of Hollywood and the powerful elites, and he wants to expose the truth. He's even friends with David Icke the reptilian Illuminati guy. Jim is always looking to awaken the masses. There's no meaning to any of this, so I, uh, I wanted to find the most meaningless thing that I could f come to and join, and, uh, and, uh, and here I am. Jim Carrey hates doing sequels, but for some reason he gave in to temptation and made a sequel to Dumb and Dumber, 20 years after the original. I remember being excited for this, but the bad reviews came pouring in, and I still haven't felt the need to watch it. I love the first one. Hell, I even watched the prequel, but this one does nothing for me. It's too late. There's no need for this. This was an example of how Jim's smart style of dumb comedy was not dumb or smart enough for today's dumb or smart minds. But the film made money, so there's that. Even though it was illegally financed with foreign funds or something, I, I don't know. It was very economically scandalous. <laughs> then, one night, in 2017, I was Netflixing, not chilling, I was just Netflixing, 
and I stumbled upon an interesting dark indie film titled The Bad Batch. It was a disturbing, thrilling, emotional ride of a movie, and one character really stood out to me. He had no lines, but his presence haunted me for days after seeing the film. And much to my surprise, I would later discover that this amazing, silent performance from an indie film came from Mr. Hollywood himself, Jim Carrey. I did not recognize this mega-famous person, and that is the sign of a great actor. This was an amazing anti-Jim Carrey performance, the opposite of everything that made him. He was no longer loud and energetic. He was quiet and tired and mysterious. No longer funny and joyful, but sad and dark. So dark. This is what we in the biz call range. And Jimbo's got it. This film is disturbing, yet beautiful. Like Jim. Another flop came with dark crimes. It might have been a little too dark. And the film was so bad that it should be considered a crime. It received 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. But that's okay, because now Jim Carrey is a painter. He paints. And he's actually pretty good. He's talented. Controversy came with some of his more politically charged paintings, of course. But the guy has an eye for color. He's completely changed his life, and he dedicates most of his time and energy to his paintings. Jim also keeps busy behind the camera, producing the Showtime series I'm Dying Up Here, based off of Jim's experiences working as a stand-up comic. He's not featured in the show, but you could feel his creative input. He also delivered some wonderful guest appearance performances on The Office and 30 Rock. And now he has Kidding, teaming up again with visionary filmmaker Michel Gondry, a movie star making the switch to television is no longer shameful. It's actually a respected step in a long career. And it's the step that Jim is on now. He's wonderful playing the host of a kid's show. And this allows him to explore and play around with his classic silliness while also tackling the dramatic stuff as the story follows his character's family life. I haven't seen much of this show, but the little that I have seen is superb. I'm planning on watching more episodes. I just, I need to finish this video. You know, deadlines. This video was due yesterday. The story of Jim Carrey is full of laughs and sadness. Such is life, I guess. Looking back at his filmography, many of his projects seem accidentally autobiographical. He's just a simple, misunderstood, good-hearted guy trying to make his way in the world by hiding behind silly faces and masks, only to be consumed by the cannibalistic world of show business barely surviving the journey as he emerges out of the primordial ooze that is Hollywood only to rediscover himself, allowing a greater understanding of heaven and earth around him. He's out of the dome. I like to think of Jim as an enlightened monk with a funny face and millions of dollars. He is a man who got so lost in the characters that he created that he forgot to create himself. So who the f*** is Jim Carrey? What the f*** is Jim Carrey? And why the f*** is Jim Carrey? And f*** Jim Carrey. <laughs> Love him or hate him, the dude is an interesting artist who always creates a stir. Oh yes, and then there's Sonic. And yes, this hedgehog started out on the wrong CGI foot. But people seem to be excited to see what Jim will do with this video game material. So will Sonic bring Jim back into the A-list? Or will he be slaughtered like horrible CGI roadkill on the side of the street? I hope it does well. I've always been a Sonic fan, and I've always been a Jim Carrey fan. Even when he was on his decline, I still believed in him. I'm the kind of guy that always roots for the class clown. I'm the kind of guy who loves to see a comedian take on dramatic material. I'm the kind of guy who will always laugh at a funny face. And I want to thank Jimmy Boy for always being that face. Because of Jim Carrey, comedy will never be the same, movies will never be the same, and the spiritual realm that we call our universe will never be the same. Because Jim Carrey is a part of it. And that's what the f*** happened to Jim Carrey.